Now, we all remember how great we felt when the women's hockey team beat the Americans in, uh, in Vancouver at the Olympics. Uh, and, I, and we saw how much you celebrated this too, but while you're clearly elated, the Canadians just expect you to mm -hmm. win. I mean, that must set up a whole new set of pressures where anything short of gold is deemed a failure. Yeah, I think when you grow up uh, playing hockey in Canada, whether it's the World Juniors, the men's team, the women's team, the expectation is the gold medal. And if you don't, uh, you know, it's kind of like we're with you, win or tie, maybe like the Leafs, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, and so there is that pressure that young kids grow up with and you expect that and you come to expect that of yourself as well. Is it fair though, that expectation? I mean, it, it's such a tough game to win yeah. all the time. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it can be a burden, I think, if, if you don't handle it properly as a team. But I don't think you want it any other way. You know, I played, um, I played softball at the Olympic level, and the expectations weren't like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I came out of that experience saying um, I'd rather have it the other way in hockey because it's, it's more fun when people want you to win, they care if you win, they're expecting you to win, and... Um, uh, it's just a better way to, to live and go about your business. For uh, 10 of the 17 years you've been with the national team, mm -hmm. you've had a fellow traveler in Noah, your, your boy. Yeah. And you tell the story of how he says, you know, Mom, do you, do you have to go to the rink again? Do you have to play hockey all the time? <laughs> I mean, that must yeah. be a, a doubly difficult to juggle the, the demands of parenthood in addition to uh, yeah. elite hockey. Well, I think so. I think maybe as females, I talk a lot when I when I speak to even business groups where, where you know women are traveling and things like that. That I think you feel a lot of guilt when you leave your kids and you you go away to work, and it's no different than what I do. Uh, I've been fortunate that I've been able to bring him with me to some of the more significant events, whether it's Olympic Games or playing professionally in Sweden. And he's had experiences that you know have added to his life that he's starting to understand, but. Um, it, it's it's hard. It tugs on your heartstrings. You know, the weeks and sometimes months that you're away can can be difficult. But I I hope that when he grows up, he he sees the other side of it as well. And he has no interest in hockey. No, none at all. He uh, <laughs> he says hockey's boring. He he brought a good book <laughs> to the Olympic gold medal final to read in case he got bored. He told me and. Uh, you know, one time we were in Florida and uh, watching Ovechkin skate, that Washington was in town, and he uh, gave Noah a stick, and Noah walked under the tunnel and turned to me and said, here, Mom, you can have this. I don't really want it. So, <laughs> you know, he's just, he's been around the best players in the world in the game, and he still has no interest. You've seen tremendous growth and progress in uh, women's hockey over the course of your career. Mm -hmm. 85,000 females registered in organized uh, hockey. That's a big number. Yeah. What was really interesting for me, though, is that the threat to women's hockey, yeah. in some respects, comes from your very success. Yeah. That you re that what you have to do is you've got to get these other teams outside of North America mm -hmm. up to scratch. Explain that to me. Yeah. Well, I think you know you've got Canada and the U.S. at seventy, eighty-five thousand players, and then uh, Sweden and Finland, the next top countries in the world, are six to eight thousand players. So you're having a huge discrepancy in the amount of numbers playing in the populations of these countries and you know trying to, to close that gap is a constant challenge but I think what we saw out of Vancouver was you know Jacques Rogue issued a challenge to women's hockey and it actually was a positive thing because uh, it, I think got us on the agenda at the World Hockey Summit here in Toronto. In and Toronto. We should explain yeah. that basically he said you know geez if you're gonna yeah. you know wallop yeah. Slovakia 18 to 1 who mm -hmm. we didn't mention previously I think beat you know, Bulgaria, Bulgaria, <laughs> eighty-two to zero. Yeah. He says maybe we should give this a rest. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Yeah, he issued a challenge, and I think it, the global hockey community accepted it and finally had to do something uh, proactive about it. The IIHF coming out of the World Summit put two million dollars back to women's hockey, and I think there the federations like the Russians, the Swiss, the Germans uh, had to be challenged to do more. And I think it's not the top four countries in the world so much as the five to ten that we really need to, to mm -hmm, bring up and mm -hmm. close that gap. And you know, with Russia hosting the next Olympics in Sochi in 2014, spending two hundred thousand dollars on your women's hockey budget is not near what it should be when Canada and the U.S. are spending almost two million. But here's here's the great irony. I mean, you've mm -hmm. been fighting for women's hockey in Canada your entire uh, adult life. Yeah. Now your job is to fight for it in Russia because here yeah. Russia's hosting the Olympics. They don't even have a women's hockey program. Yeah. No, they uh, they women's hockey's played in six rinks in the entire country of Russia. And, Why? Uh, Why is that? 
Well, it's a it's, great it's, hockey nation. Like it's Canada. a great hockey nation. And I asked Vladislav Tretiak at the summit, I said, why don't women play hockey in Russia? I heard you didn't just ask. I heard you gave it to him. <laughs> I bet. Well, I, I, I issued a challenge to him for sure. I mean, when he told me, well, women don't want to play hockey in Russia, that just was an unacceptable answer. And, uh, you know, I did challenge him. I said, you, you know, you need to do more and maybe centralize like the Red Army, like you guys did all those years ago. You could, because they have some very good players and great athletes, and they know how to develop athletes in Russia. So if they wanted to, they could have a very good team in a very short period of time. But I think if you also look at the way women's hockey's come in, in the last 22 years of international play, uh, we've grown and developed faster than the men's game has in the same time period. Right. You know, so you look at in, in men's hockey, it took Sweden 100 years to win a, a gold medal in the Olympics, Finland almost the same to win world championships. So, you know, we're, we're developing actually at a pretty good rate. Now, I understand you're also lobbying the NHL to help mm -hmm. you in your goal to strengthen international hockey. What's yeah. your basic pitch to them? Well, it's a group uh, led by the, the CWHL in the East and the WWHL in the West, and, and uh, they're working to put together a business plan, which basically would be a partnership, sponsorship arrangement with the NHL, um, p looking at pairing five to six teams throughout Eastern, possibly Western Canada, um, and almost like a, yeah, a sponsorship sort of arrangement. Okay, so there's a professional women's league, let's say. Mm -hmm. We could see how that would benefit the Canadian women ho hockey player. How is yeah. that going to benefit the international game? Well, I envision it, uh, you have these teams in, in Canada and the U.S. based in North America. You would uh, bring in uh, the top European players to play in these leagues, and it would be very similar to what Boris Salming did with the, coming to the Leafs. He accelerated yeah. that 100-year period that Sweden needed to, to yeah. get because there all of a sudden was a role model. Exactly. And, right. and they go home with uh, less intimidation. They can compete day to day. They can see that you know, what it's like. They learn how to win in this environment, which is very different over in Europe. Uh, I think it would change a lot of those cultures and a lot of those perceptions that, that happen in, in Europe. So that's how I see it developing the game is the players take the knowledge back and grow the game. We just went, mentioned in passing how much the game has changed since, uh, since mm -hmm. you got, got into it. I mean, when you were a little girl, you had to play on boys' teams. There wasn't yes. even a girl team. What's been the impetus for change? What has really caused things to move, uh, move along in your view? Well, I think it's... It has to do with the national team and Olympic exposure. I think the, the first world championships in 1990 were huge for me, uh, watching those pink jerseys in Ottawa, uh, the first ever women's worlds, and not even knowing that girls played hockey until right. that day well, that I saw You mentioned it. you had no role models that were female. No, none, none. And so growing up wanting to play on the national team and then the Olympic exposure in 98, I think you know parents see it as a you know, great place to put their girls in hockey and they have a chance to achieve a dream like I did. Uh, and we always see huge increases in registration after an Olympic Games, which is, you know, after the 02 Games, we, we now see a crop of 16 to 20 year old kids that are really good that started playing hockey, you know, back then. And I think that's been the biggest reason. To keep it an elite level, you've gone as far as playing with men, not mm -hmm. when you were little, but as yeah. a, a professional uh, adult in yeah. uh, Finland and, and Sweden, I guess. Now, what was that like? Well, it was a, a whole range of experiences from, um, you know, the first time I went to Finland and, and uh, arriving and being chased around by the biggest guy on the ice to just because the coach needed to see if I could handle the physicality sure. of, of, of getting hit day in and day out to people not thinking I could play to going in the first year and winning the, the championship in the league and moving up to the, the first division, um, you know, to going back years later and back to Sweden and this time taking my family and... Um, you know, having a great experience that way. So, uh, you know, every day it forced me to got, come out of my comfort zone and I had to be at my best, whether it was a practice or, or a game. Otherwise, I could get hurt or I might not get the ice time. Um, everybody was always watching. So I think that prepared me well for pressures of Olympic Games and things like that, which really nothing can probably come close to what I experienced playing in Europe. Did you ever have to drop the gloves and duke it out with those guys? <laughs> no, uh, I, I've been on the ice during a few fights, but I usually just grab on and hang on and hope somebody comes, but uh, I wouldn't last too long. Now, you've committed to uh, the 2014 uh, Olympics, but in the interim, mm -hmm. you've had a, what some people think is an odd kind of uh, career choice. Is you're going back to university, mm -hmm. you're going to work on the balance of your degree to get into to medical school, and you're going to mm -hmm. play for the University of Calgary Dinos. Yep. Why? 
<laughs> Why not? Uh, you know, it's a combination of many things. Um, I've played on our club team, the Oval Extreme, that was in Calgary right. for a long time, which doesn't exist anymore. And uh, uh, want to stay in Calgary, need a place to play. Uh, also wanted to go back and finish my degree, which I'd planned before 2010 finished. Uh, and so just the combination of both of those factors and the fact that Danielle Goyette, my former line mate and teammate with the national team, is the, the head coach. coach. Yeah. And so it's, it's a great training environment. I'm on the ice every day. It's the closest I can find to coming to pro hockey. Uh, it's not quite the level of pro hockey for sure, but uh, everything else around it is something I really enjoy. Given that hockey is Canada's game, mm -hmm. I mean, do you think you make a difference in kind of holding the country together? Not all by yourself, yeah, but I, I mean, does women's hockey, is it starting to play the kind of role mm -hmm. that men's hockey has in terms of forming our identity and giving us a sense of who we are? I think it is. I, I, you know, since to the 2002 win in Salt Lake City, which was a very emotional win that many Canadians will never forget, I think that, you know, the women's team has a place in the hearts of many Canadians. And I also think that hockey, unlike much other anything else that we have in this country brings people together. Um, it's almost a, a religion, it's, it's a common ground for all Canadians regardless of who you are and so I think on the women's side uh, our team um, a lot of people can uh, relate to. We're average people, normal people that are doing something considered extraordinary every, f every four years um, but you know holding down regular jobs, regular lives, not multi-millionaires that are paid and so I think people can relate to that and um, and maybe that's inspiring some of the stories that we have and the women that we have on our team. Hey, Lee Wickenheiser, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thanks, Alan.